Stanford University. I'm Larry Horton. I'm a member of the program committee and a member of the board of the Stanford Historical Society. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this final, our final program for the academic year. Uh, I should note that our final program at last academic year was to discuss and explore the amazing McMurtry building. And I'm glad to see that the McMurtrys are here for a discussion of the SAP building. Uh, the Stanford Historical Society exists to preserve and celebrate Stanford history by publishing books and papers on Stanford history and by presenting public programs on different aspects of our history. It is fitting uh, that we end a year of excellent programs with a celebration of the restoration and return to academic use of one of the grand and early buildings of the university. As we walk or bike around the campus, we are continually reminded of the extraordinary generosity of the Stanford family and their singular gift of the land and buildings of this great university. And if we look more carefully, we will see many new buildings and many older buildings that have been refitted for new generations. These new and refitted buildings are largely made possible by the generosity of others inspired to keep the legacy of the Stanfords this living and breathing university, fresh and in service. With that in mind, it is truly fitting that our first speaker of today is Richard Sapp, whose family gift enabled a Jane Stanford building, damaged and closed for decades, to once again be put into service for students and scholars. Rick Sapp graduated from Stanford in 1978 with a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, and he later earned an MBA from the University of Pennsylvania. Rick spent much of his career with Goldman Sachs, mostly in London, working on international financial projects in the Middle East and in Asia. The Sapp family has generally supported financial aid for Stanford students, as well as supported several university multidisciplinary programs. Rick served on the Board of Trustees from 2008 to 2013. And during his service as chairman of the Command Committee on Land and Buildings, Rick became acquainted with the sad state of old Kim, boarded up and unused. Rick will now speak to us on reflections on the restoration of old Kim. It's my great pleasure to address the Stanford Historical Society on the occasion of its annual meeting in the SAP Center, but as I more affectionately call it, Old Chem. I'm really still not used to hearing, <laughs> so I, you'll, as you'll see later, I... <clears throat> but before I give, be, begin my formal remarks, let me just take a moment to acknowledge uh, with my heartfelt appreciation, uh, President Tessier Levine, former President Hennessy, former Provost Echemendi, Dean Saller, the faculty of the biology and chemistry departments, the university architect and the land and buildings professionals, the general contractors, architects, the development office, and all the others at Stanford who were involved in the successful completion of this project. And to my fellow donors who joined together to support this great endeavor, I give my eternal gratitude. As did many freshmen pre-meds in the mid-1970s, I studied here in Old Chem in the basement to learn the fine art of the scientific method as applied to the field of chemistry. The faculty did their very best to inspire me, and the teaching assistants did their very best to torture me. <laughs> I freely admit that I was not a natural at controlling reactions to achieve the proper end products. Bonding theories, moles, Avogadro's number swirled in my brain, but it was organic chemistry that finished me. <laughs> and that's probably why I drifted away from pre-med to the electrical engineering and computer science area, 
where it was a much simpler task to manage and herd the electrons and to count using zeros and ones. <laughs> but returning to campus in 2005 after living abroad in England since 1987, I was somewhat startled and sad to see that old chem was still shuttered and abandoned, structurally weakened by the Loma Prieta earthquake and, and bypassed to some degree by modern laboratory science. Its usefulness was in question. Its future was uncertain. The founding building had become a wildlife sanctuary for honeybees, <laughs> birds, and bats, and a hideout for graduate students conducting midnight scavenger hunts for famous brains. <laughs> students, it's true, <laughs> students, it's a, it's a rite of passage to break into this building, I heard. But students walking past at night quickened their pace to pass this dark and brooding and broken windowed facade. It was Stanford's unofficial haunted house. In 2008, <clears throat> while serving as a trustee and then chair of the Land and Buildings Committee, we received a report from Land and Buildings on the earthquake readiness status of the over 750 buildings on Stanford's campus. Only three buildings remained in the red safety category. The old medical school adult hospital, the anatomy building, and old chem. But a new medical building, the Lee Kai Shing building, and the new Stanford adult hospital were going to ultimately replace the first. And the fabulous McMurtry building, which you visited last year, would replace the second. But sadly, there were no plans for Mrs. Stamper's old chem. Historic, but languishing, last on the list of 750 buildings. It was an awkward subject. There seemed to be no will or desire to determine its fate. I was intrigued and I reached out for some historical material and articles about old chem to find out more about the history. And in interpreting that, in my mind, Mrs. Stanford was a bit of a visionary supporter of the hot science of her day, chemistry. There were many discoveries around that 1900 period of new gases and radioactive elements, theories of atomic structure, uh, the technique of chromatography, a process to make ammonia for agricultural fertilizers. It was a hot area, lots of activity. Biology and physics we're in different phases, a little bit you know, on the edge of, of getting some momentum, but a little bit behind chemistry. Chemistry was given this large building in a field, a respectable distance, and a safe distance <laughs> from Memorial Church and the quad, which we know Mrs. Stanford loved. Have you ever noticed how prominent the name Department of Chemistry is displayed on the Palm Drive side of this building? And that was there to provide fair warning for all passers-by <laughs> in case of fire and smoke that explosives research was the big thing in the early 1900s. And in researching her personal writings, Mrs. Stanford had, had hoped and prayed for old chem that it would st will still stand and serve all those future generations of Stanford students coming here to gain an education. Old Chem withstood the catastrophic 1906 earthquake that felled two other of the noble buildings. Soldier John, <coughs> Soldier John through two world wars, an intervening depression to witness many breakthroughs in chemistry and to house multiple Nobelists. And finally to, to see the rise of Stanford and Silicon Valley in mid-century only, only to be idled as you've heard in the late 1980s. My uh, whispered lamentations in the trustee halls that something noble was rotting in the idyllic state of Stanford <laughs> must have registered with <coughs> President Hennessy and Provost Echemendi. They came together and we had several energetic and creative discussions supported by the ever-present and ever-efficient Stanford staff to conjure up a restoration vision for this building that could solve a number of other issues that the university was facing, and to combine some of the themes that Stanford was trying to project. First, 
a restored old chem would house undergraduate teaching labs and classrooms and combined department libraries for both the biology and the chemistry departments, which frankly up to that point has been relatively unheard of to actually share things. The concept of interdisciplinary teaching between those fields would be encouraged by having the faculty in the same building teaching in the laboratories. And in designing the restoration and the facilities here, they would work side by side and have to get to know each other and to share their ideas and their hopes for the building. And ultimately design a laboratory curriculum that would serve a 21st century Stanford science students. The convergence of the life sciences and chemistry could be harmonized into an integrated versus a siloed teaching approach. And these new millennial students will be taught laboratory research tools, techniques, and interdisciplinary practices that Mrs. Stanford could never have conceived of. They will migrate as undergraduate researchers into the Bass Biology Building, the BioX Clark Center, the medical school, medical research laboratories, and the neurosciences and the ChemH Institutes, all of which are within 10 minutes walk from here. Old Chem will anchor one end of a new science quad opposite Bass Biology and become a vibrant stop on a walk from the quad to the new and fabulous arts district. The faculty and students hopefully will appreciate the wonderful high ceiling rooms, the golden glow of the sandstone walls in morning and evening light, and experience the, the ties to history of Stanford that are embodied here in this building. Once again, it will be filled with energetic students tramping up and down those historic iron staircases. You can see those are original. Those young minds will be inspired by our terrific faculty and they'll be tortured by the teaching assistants, but now they'll have new interdisciplinary methods. <laughs> So the world, I invite the world to come here to behold the imaginative design and architecture and construction that has restored this building. The time, treasure, and love of the Stanford community and generous donors together have finally answered Mrs. Stanford's hopes and prayers for old chem. We are indeed slow learners, for it took a quarter century to pass before the realization that it could only have been to her successor presidents, trustees, and grateful alumni, to me in truth, that Mrs. Stanford was writing all those years ago with the faith that we would uphold her vision for Old Kim. My family's lead gift for the restoration was inspired by both the gratitude to and recognition of a great woman and her university and to provide all of those benefits I have recited. But the SAP Center intends in no fashion by its name to distract from the true significance of this building. Our gift without doubt is humble in the presence of hers. Here from the beginning, around us stands an enduring monument to one of the greatest individual gifts to the academy and to humanity writ large, the Leland Stanford Junior University. 125 years strong. Now, Old Chem is lovingly restored and takes its rightful place again, dedicated to service for future generations of students as she had wished. Once again, to be, for ages to come, Jane Stanford's noble building. Thank you very much. Stanford has many people who work full-time on land and buildings. They are highly skilled, and they all contribute to this marvelous campus that we know all love and treasure. But no one, in my view, has as much influence over the look and feel of the Stanford campus today as does our next speaker, David Lennox, our university architect and executive director of campus planning and design. David is responsible for our campus master plan, which seeks to restore the original Olmsted plan. David is also responsible for our overall campus guidelines, the design guidelines, which establishes the rules under which all projects are planned and built. You may also be surprised to, uh, to know how many different levels of review there are for every single building project 
uh, at Stanford. In addition to reviews by departments, each, for each building, there are multiple reviews by the university cabinet and the board of trustees. David escorts every single project through these wickets. To mention just a few of the buildings completed on David's watch illustrates his importance to Stanford. The Bing Concert Hall, the Wendover Contemplation Center, the School of Medicine headquarters, the Science and Engineering Quad, the Newcomb Building for the Law School, the New Business School, the Knight Management Center, the McMurtry Building for Art and Art History, and of course, the SAP Center, where we are now. Our campus remains beautiful while growing to meet new academic talent challenges, and I think that David Lennox has played a key role in this success. David will now speak to us on a short history of Old Kim and how it was restored. Wow, thank you, Larry. That was, that was a, a great introduction. I had the pleasure of working with uh, Rick Sapp and his family on, on this project, and they truly were a catalyst to make this vision a reality, um, honestly. And what I got out of our first meeting was, was not as much about the history of the building, but the drive to really improve teaching lab quality here at campus. It was really important to them. As Larry said, I've been involved in a lot of, of work here, a lot of dedications of new buildings, including the McMurtry building. Uh, but I have to say, when we dedicated this building last October, uh, you could just see that it touched the heart and soul of so many people that had come to that, that um, dedication ceremony. Those are the same people that um, the faculty, the students, the staff, alums, that had walked by this building, as Rick had said, and kept scratching their heads and saying, what is the university gonna do with this thing? Um, and honestly, there were rumors that it was gonna be demolished, I think, for 25 years. Uh, we had honestly took it, taken a look at, at putting administrative offices, making it a dedicated classroom building, a dedicated library, uh, but I, I don't think it was until we got to the poetry of bringing back the original program, the original use of this building, that this got any traction at all. So what I'm going to do is just talk a little bit about the journey to actually make the decision, our approach to renovation, how it happened. Okay. So students and faculty have certainly been the foundation for our campus. They've really helped us establish a culture here at Stanford. Um, and my favorite at the bottom left-hand corner of this slide, um, the students of yesteryear looking at their cell phones and texting, um, <laughs> absolutely not paying attention to the person next to them. We would have loved to restore and preserve this building absolutely to be exactly as it was before, but that wasn't realistic. Uh, teaching has changed, pedagogy, uh, codes have changed. So those students really have influenced our students of today. And I think what our objective was, was to breathe new life into this building and really make this appropriate for uh, the new Stanford student. And I could go through and talk about history, all the loose periods of architecture and landscape architecture. I'll do that another time. But I think what's really wonderful about this project, it touches both the sandstone age as well as 21st century planning. I always have to go back to the Frederick Law Olmsted plan that is the foundation of everything I do and what we do here at the university. On the left, uh, this wonderful plan that has this network of north, south, east, west axes and malls, the extension of the quads in an east-west orientation, buffers of the arboretum and the foothills, uh, and our commitment, the diagram on the right, our commitment to restoring those original concepts in 1991 because we had sort of lost our way for a while. And here's our campus today. Just want to give you a little bit of background. In the red dashed line is the campus drive. Uh, and in the circle, uh, the, the blue dashed circle is uh, the SAP Center. And as we start to look to the future and lots of expansion to the west side of campus, again, fulfilling that Olmsted plan, um, we think this building is absolutely well positioned for future locations for academics and research, as well as for student housing. But let's dial in a little closer. We have the, uh, the main quad, 
science and engineering quad to the west, school of medicine to the north of that, and then the basic sciences quad. And I think what's really important is in this age of uh, working with multiple disciplines, we have to, as planners, make sure it's really easy to connect. So the faculty member at the School of Medicine has to be able to get over to talk to a grad student in engineering or somebody working in biology or chemistry. And my, my role is to make sure that we organize this campus well to make those things happen. So at the School of Medicine, we created the Discovery Walk. It was that spine that connected uh, all the buildings together. It goes through the portals of the Clark Center across Campus Drive over to this basic science area. And when you really squint at this image, there's kind of no there there. There's a, a lot of buildings built over time. They accommodated extra program. But if you look at the image in the upper right-hand corner of that second century plan, you see there's a green square, there's meant to be something here. And so we created a long-term vision to create another quad, I call it a commons, it's a little more casual, a little smaller than the SEQ, and we're very fortunate that we have two projects that anchor this quad, uh, the Bass Biology Building and the SAP Center, and they are this first step in getting to that place where we have a wonderful sense of place here in this new location. How did we get there? Well, the biology building was part of the, the SEMC initiative, which included the four buildings at the SEQ, uh, the stem cell building, as well, the, as well as the LKSC. And when we had to figure out how to locate the biology building, we knew we had to do a long-range plan for this area. That also included um, starting to take a look at teaching labs. And we originally had uh, located teaching labs to the south of the biology building, and we took that pretty far. We had a four-story biology building, a full basement, maybe even two levels in the basement, teaching labs to the south in a three-story building. And we all got pretty excited about that, but there were some, set, there were some, some things that didn't work out that great with that plan. So we thought it was a good chance to revisit, are we putting those teaching labs in the right place? And it was about that time that Rick was talking about that we were starting to have discussions about old chemistry. And we decided to take a, a look at could teaching labs work here. And so we went to the provost, we did some very simple stacking uh, program diagrams, um, understood that we wouldn't be able to fit everything we needed in this building unless we did an addition. So we had talked about how we would do that addition. So what I wanna to talk to you about now is what was that preservation? What was that renovation? What was the transformation um, of this building that leads you to be able to sit here today? Here's that wonderful 1930s map. I'm not sure if this is what um, was framed, but probably pretty close. Um, and you can see the main quad in the center and the oval. And if I, if I zoom in a little bit, you can see old chem to the right. And there were really two buildings here. Uh, there was an essay lab that was on the west side, a smaller scale building where they did more, um, I'll say, sensitive uh, procedures out there. And you could even see in this image that with um, the earthquake had already happened and so the museum um, was, a lot of it had come down in the earthquake. Anatomy was already part of the, the back wing. So the building itself, designed by Clinton Day, um, he also did uh, portions of the design of the church um, and I think that um, it really, you can interpret it a lot of different ways in terms of architectural style, but for most of it, it's a blend of the Richardsonian Romanesque, but in a much more vertical sense. And Mrs. Stanford believed in the spirituality as well as the experiential of being able to, um, you know, graduate well-rounded students. And so it's no, uh, it's probably no coincidence this building has some of the elements of the church in it. Completed in 1902, first classes were in 1903, 60,000 square feet at a cost of $233,000. <laughs> um, even, even with that, you know, the, the urban legend is that Mrs. Stanford was quite upset with the cost of the, of the hardware and the fact there were so many doors with glass in them. I think she would have been even more shocked if she knew how much we invested to renovate this building, but I, I think, 
from my standpoint, this is one of the best values that we've, we've uh, spent money on in the last 20 years here because it, this building will absolutely be here forever um, and it really will serve us well. 39 original chimneys and of course one of the last sandstone buildings that Mrs. Stanford worked on. This is the front elevation. Uh, they considered the elevation on Lamita to be the front. Very symmetrical, very ordered, a little bit more ornamentation. Uh, but what's very curious is it because of its the strength of that pediment, you still don't have a center entrance. This was not meant to be a building with a big, glorious lobby. It was a workhorse. It was a building that really served the purpose of the faculty and the students. In fact, if you went up the right entry or the left entry, it was a very narrow corridor that connected those two to um, just really make this a very efficient building. Now, if I go to the other facade, that is the west facade, uh, very symmetrical, two entrances again, uh, but a little less ornamentation, a little simpler. And uh, there was actually a building sitting in front of this uh, as you can see in this building section, the SA Lab to the right. Um, old Chem, the cut through building section, shows two primary levels, an attic level and a, and a lower level where Rick went to school. I don't know, you must have bumped your head a lot on the pipes down there. Um, and then the elevations of those buildings. So, you know, it stood proudly. Um, and it was a beautiful building. You could actually see it from the oval and from the quad because there was a lot less mature vegetation. Um, but of course, this is the little fun stuff I get to do. Um, we had an earthquake, right? 1906, 39 of those chimneys came down, the frontispiece came down, uh, and everybody sort of was sad, but this building actually performed better than the other, other noble buildings of Mrs. Stanford. Um, it was restored, chemistry came back, um, and you can tell from these photographs it was a very orderly building, it wasn't fancy, um, e but even in the utility areas it had a sense of rigor and, and actually beauty in how the equipment would come together. When we yeah. toured the building in 2013, um, you sort of got the sense of what had happened in this building years and years ago, but you also got the sense of what had recently happened with as we say, the students that love to come in here and um, play games. Um, but there was a lot of, of attributes. And what we had to do is, as we programmed and, and figured out what the program of this building would be, we had to come up with a strategy how we were going to restore this, what was going to be important. And, and Dr. Laura Jones, Sapna Marfadio from my office, really helped to define what those sort of character defining elements of this building would be. What were the most important things we wanted to preserve? If you take a look, um, the cast iron stairs, the ornamental railings, really an important feature to this building. The high windows, the true divided lights were character defining. Uh, the cupola, the cupolas, the exterior cladding, the sandstone, the gutters, the downspouts, the windows themselves, again, all important elements that we fought for during the design process to make sure that they would come back in their full glory. This is the first floor plan. Uh, it was also important to maintain the volumes of the labs. I think that's what people remember about this building. And so labs positioned in each of the corners of the wings um, but we didn't really want to restore that narrow hallway that was on the main level. We wanted to open it up, make sure that students could come in, collaborate. Uh, also want to make sure that we could highlight those two cast iron stairs, which are going to be so important to the ethos of the building. And then the addition, which we are sitting in today, the auditorium, the lecture hall, and the gallery allowed us to do a terrace up above, which is level with the main floor. And the reason that was important, we wanted to make sure that, that what was considered the original rear facade would actually be our second primary facade because it's going to be facing that commons uh, someday. Uh, we're working uh, towards a future plan on that, but it was really important that this wasn't perceived as the back of the building. We wanted this to be energetic, the hub for students. I want to take you through some of the construction shots because they're really interesting. I call it the cathedral shot on the left. Um, this building had to be absolutely gutted. Everything in the middle of the building, other than the four walls, 
gone, went away. Uh, we had to reconstruct the roof. All the roof tiles had to be pulled off, put back on. Uh, just that cupola alone, we had many um, very interesting discussions in our office about should we spend the extra money to do that custom clay tile because you can just see the shape of that cupola wasn't a typical clay tile. And, and we did feel that was an important investment. But this shows um, the inside of the building, a beautiful natural light. We dug out the basement floor to get more head height in this lower area so it could be very usable, very habitable space. You can even see from on the right-hand screen, that's one of those main entrance doors floating way up there in the, in the, in the air. And I think you know, when, when you take a look at the final product, there was a lot of care during the process to design to make sure that what ended up being preserved, restored, specifically on the exterior to start with, was really worth the effort. Even the redwood trees, uh, those are transplanted redwood trees. Those were not here before. We brought those in to provide scale for the building. And even as we opened the building, the terrace, though it wasn't totally animated, we even on a cool, sunny day found visitors already reclining in the lounge chairs. That's kind of cool. So I'm just going to take you through a few before and after shots before I close. This is a, a shot of that cast iron stair. And again, we, we fought hard to make sure this was an important character-defining element of this building. It needed a lot of work, of course, uh, but over the course of the construction, again, taken out of the building, lovingly restored, put back together. But we also had to make sure that we provided code improvements guardrails that were higher than they were used to um, in the old days, uh, had to make sure that the stair performed um, in a case of emergency. Now, what you may not realize is that we had to add two extra fire stairs to be able to keep these two stairs open, but we thought that would be worth it. The wainscoting also was a character-defining feature. Uh, in fact, we reused uh, quite a bit of the existing wainscot that was uh, salvaged, but we also supplemented that with new to make sure that the character was correct in certain parts of the building that were important to us. As we toured this building, trying to, again, um, figure out what we were going to do, I don't think we really understood the power of the windows. I mean, it, they were all boarded up, painted over, um, and we said, oh yes, let's restore the windows, they'll be great. Um, I think when people walk upstairs on the main level, that is the first comment I always get is how beautiful those windows are. And what was important to us is even if we had a contemporary intervention, we did a curved glass wall, it needed to reflect and respond to those windows. So you can see the proportion of the muttons and the sash and it's called nightfall color of the windows is replicated in that curved glass wall. Um, and it really starts to play off uh, the very old, the very historic, the very um, uh, cherished with this idea of let's breathe some energy and new life into the building at the same time. Uh, as we excavated the rear or the, the west side of the elevation, um, we had to dig out to make way for where we're sitting today. Uh, and that transformed itself into that gallery that we've just stepped out of. And what's important about the gallery is we, we really want to do a skylight that let natural light into this lower level, make that space a wonderful uh, place to collaborate for the students. But it also helps to accent the beautiful materials of the building and really um, all times of the day. Also note, as you walk out both to the left and to the right, there are walls that are preserved that tell the story. So there's the brick back up, there's the stone, there's the new stucco that we did to stabilize it. Um, really an interesting story as well. A typical lab. Um, we had schemes where we said, let's put a floor in there. Um, we just thought that the volume was so beautiful, the windows so beautiful, they're part of, again, the character of this building. And so when you start to look at the transformation of these labs, 
Uh, you note how the fume hoods are, are quietly injected uh, the same color as a wall, so they, they sort of go away as a form, but the real boldness of the architecture. And the pedagogy here really um, also is able to transform itself from, from these rows and rows of benches to um, team-based learning um, and research. And I think everybody's smiling in this picture, so that's why I always use it. <laughs> They're all models, so it didn't really matter, but. <laughs> So as, as Rick said, this, this is a jewel. This building is a jewel for our campus. It's a shame, and, and don't yell at me. This is a mirror image, so the words are all backwards, but it goes well with um, the final product. I, I'm so proud that we were able to, to breathe new life into this building and, and do it in the right manner and do it in the right ways uh, to, to be able to sort of find that juxtaposition that works between the contemporary state-of-the-art teaching labs, and the historic preservation, renovation, and transformation. So thank you. Well, now, now that we've got the stage set, uh, as part of our final presentation, um, by the way, following our presentation, all the speakers will be here and we will have a short Q&A session, so hold to stay with us. Uh, as uh, we're honored today in this final portion to have uh, John Brownman, the J.G. Jackson and C.J. Wood Professor of Chemistry Emeritus, talk to us about Stanford chemistry, tradition, and transition. John was born in Pennsylvania and educated at MIT before coming west to Berkeley where he, he was, earned his PhD in uh, 1963. By good fortune, John's first job with his newly minted doctorate after a quick NSF postdoctoral fellowship at UCLA was as an assistant professor here at Stanford in the Department of Chemistry. Demonstrating his good judgment, John has remained at Stanford ever since. <laughs> Rising to the ranks, serving twice as chairman of the Department of Chemistry and serving as an associate dean for the natural sciences and humanities and sciences and as an associate dean for research. His honors are too numerous to recite. People say that, but they really are. You should see how long they are. But they include the National Medal of Science awarded by the president uh, in the White House and many awards for excellence in chemistry. Uh, and of course, John received a Dean's Award for Outstanding Teaching. John is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and another long, long list of scientific and professional organizations. John Brownman's research has advanced the understanding of the factors that determine the rates and products of chemical reactions. His primary areas of effort have involved the spectroscopy, photochemistry, reaction dynamics, and reaction mechanisms of gas phase ions. I know that is correct because I lifted it from a chemistry department website. Uh, my personal knowledge of John goes back many years. The John Brownman I knew and admired was an active citizen of the university, easily approachable, always insightful, and always helpful. You could always get John's opinions, but you would get them straight and direct. And now let's have the pleasure of hearing John's views on Stanford chemistry, tradition, and transition. I wonder who he was talking about. <laughs> I'm uh, delighted to be here today uh, to help celebrate the resurrection of old chem as the new and exciting uh, SAP Center for Science, Teaching, and Learning. My topic is an important one because it's an example at the department level of the transformation that began in the 1950s, which changed Stanford from a strong, vibrant, but regional university to the world-class university you see today. I'm a good person to do this. 
in as much as I have been a Stanford faculty member longer than anyone who is else who's still living in the department, chemistry department. And uh, that makes me a connection historically that goes pretty far back. Stanford admitted its first uh, student in 1891, the year that uh, John Stillman was appointed uh, the first professor of chemistry. Old chemistry was occupied in 1903. And the, among the early faculty, I personally knew Perce Mitchell, who joined the faculty in 1906. And roughly 50 years later, in the late 1950s, uh, Frederick Terman and Wally Sterling uh, reinvented Stanford. And I lived, if you could call it that, uh, through the transition uh, in the early 1960s. My story today is basically a presentation of the people and facilities of Stanford chemistry. And many of you will have met some of these characters as your teachers. As Rick Sapp noted, you may have loved some, hated others. And I hope I wasn't the instructor that turned Rick off in organic chemistry. <laughs> So let's begin. Uh, first of all, I have to acknowledge where all this came from. Eric Hutchinson wrote this history of the Stanford Chemistry Department, which is incredibly useful and a valuable guide to what went on here. Uh, a second edition, which covered more recent uh, times, was written by Harry Mosier. Uh, and uh, updated uh, significantly by W. E. Murner and Carol Mosier. And there's a book by uh, Stuart Gilmore about Fred Terman and Silicon Valley, which uh, is a very useful guide to much of what went on in this period. So just as a little history, uh, <clears throat> Quarterstone was laid in 1887. Uh, uh, First students came in 1891. John Stillman was the first professor. The history is pretty interesting. Uh, as you can see here, <clears throat> he was a, uh, basically worked for a, chem a sugar company, was appointed in 1891. You wonder how this happened. And this is how the old boy network used to work. <laughs> uh, shortly after uh, Professor Stillman's appointment, uh, these gentlemen uh, were appointed. And that was the basis of the department for a number of years. The first chemistry lab was actually uh, in the main chemistry building, which turned out to be next to Memorial Church. On the right-hand side is building 60, and uh, was occupied by the uh, dean's office, dean of research office for a while. And I actually had an office in there as well. But the first chemistry uh, lab was uh, building was in building 60. And uh, you can see why Mrs. Stanford didn't want it there. <laughs> uh, so the main chemistry building, as uh, David said, 60,000 square feet, $233,000, uh, a bargain at any, under any circumstances, occupied at first by 1903. And there it is in all its glory. Uh, you might wonder, actually, why it had 39 chimneys. And for those of you that are not familiar with the process of doing chemistry, if hoods which uh, remove the uh, noxious gases and odors 
from chemical reactions are now run by uh, HVAC uh, machinery, big fans that draw air up through the hoods uh, that you saw in the new version. But in the old days, in order to get an air draft, what you used was a chimney and the air draft from the fires that were built down below uh, carried the gases up, up to the chimneys. And that's the reason there were so many of them in, the, in that building. And of course, uh, they were vulnerable to the earthquake and a lot of them all fell down and then had to be replaced. Uh, the first of the newer faculty was uh, Robert Swain, got his PhD at Yale. An early appointment was Edward Curtis Franklin, who I discovered reading Gilmore's book, had a son uh, uh, who was a good friend of, of Frederick Terman. Franklin was a very well-known chemist, president of the American Chemical Society, member of the National Academy of Sciences. He was unquestionably uh, a distinguished and extraordinary member of the chemistry faculty here, and one who I think had uh, far and away the uh, most substantial reputation. Purse Mitchell was an early appointment, as I say, in 1906 as an instructor. He, uh, amongst other things, was the uh, mayor of Palo Alto, uh, treasurer of the university, and uh, without question, uh, an important person in the university. And uh, I knew him uh, uh, long after his retirement, and he was a uh, quite an interesting guy. I should say that uh, Professor Swain actually served as president of the university for a short period uh, when, uh, when there was a, vaca a, a vacancy in that appointment. Sloan. George Parks <coughs> was an important person uh, in the department. He was the executive head, made a lot of appointments, did uh, thermochemistry, and uh, had a reasonably strong rep uh, reputation, but not uh, uh, a really well-known guy. Francis Bergstrom was a young man who was appointed to the faculty. One of the things, uh, he, we now have a uh, Paul Wender as the Bergstrom Professor of Chemistry. Uh, if you do a tour of the building, you can find in some of the glass, as a student, as some of the students managed to etch their names in the glass, and you can find Professor Bergman's uh, <laughs> legacy, amongst other things, uh, in, as part of the building, which is quite remarkable, actually. And uh, it's really fun to take a tour and see this. Uh, James McBain, a well-known uh, chemist who uh, trained a lot of, of very good students. And Phil Layton, who worked, as, his famous work with uh, A. Noyes was uh, photochemistry of gases and uh, had a major impact on uh, atmospheric science and uh, many of his students became quite famous. And, uh, and Leighton uh, was a major force in the department. And all these people were gone by the time I came. So just to get you calibrated on this. Uh, now, there were a whole bunch of newer faculty that were appointed by, uh, uh, by Leighton and Parks. Murray Luck who started annual reviews, also started the co-op that used to be the co-op market in Palo Alto. Carl Noller, who wrote a very famous textbook. He was a terrifying guy, he was really big. And uh, got his degree with Roger Adams. Fred Koenig, who did statistical mechanics, a real scholar and an extraordinary gentleman. 
Hubert Loring, who worked on uh, vitamin D and the polio virus, and, and was also uh, a, an interesting guy, again, rather underrated. Dick Ogg was a young man, got his degree here. He only wanted to do experiments that were going to win Nobel Prizes. <laughs> and, and he did some that were very close to doing that. He was a really wonderful scientist. And he, uh, he was uh, also an avid outdoorsman and died uh, quite young. Uh, Butch Tostado, who taught physical chemistry uh, uh, and uh, general science. Harry Mosier, who uh, is the invented uh, the Mosier reagent, did a lot with uh, asymmetric synthesis. Bill Bonner, who did a lot with uh, catalysts and hydrogenation and Dick Eastman, who studied mechanistic uh, photochemistry, and Doug Skoog, who was, uh, did analytical chemistry, wrote a lot of famous textbooks, Eric Hutchinson, who wrote that uh, history that I talked about, also all of the banners and all of the symbolic things you see around the campus uh, were Eric's uh, work. And David Mason, who started the uh, chemical engineering department, which originally had been part of chemistry and had been recruited from Caltech and made, had a major impact on the department. There were some really distinguished people that came out of Stanford in that period, including uh, William Harkins, who was a professor at Chicago, member of the academy, uh, won all kinds of awards, had a lot of very famous students. Uh, Conrad Fernelius, uh, who was the president of the Coppers Company and a, a professor at Penn State. Uh, Monty Spate, who was the president of Royal Dutch Shell. We have a, Ed Solomon has his Spate chair uh, in chemistry, which was uh, named after him. John Ferry, who was a physical chemist and polymer chemist at the University of Wisconsin. Francis Blasse, who was a student of Phil Layton's, did a lot of photochemistry at UCLA. And Bryce Crawford, who uh, was uh, ended up at Minnesota one of the people that was strongly considered as the possible uh, executive head of chemistry when it was when Fred Terman decided to uh, fix the department, and Jerry Vinograd at Caltech, who did a lot of stuff with DNA and uh, basic uh, sedimentation processes that were used uh, to discover how DNA was replicated. <clears throat> And John Daly, who studied frog poisons, uh, who was at, at the NIH, and it should have been wearing safety glasses. <laughs> there were a lot of uh, well-known people who didn't stay here. Uh, Blasse, who was at UCLA, uh, Maurice Huggins, uh, who went to Kodak. His son is a professor in uh, material science. Uh, Paul Cross, who went to Washington, and then to Brown, who was uh, Bryce Crawford's uh, advisor. Hal Johnson, who did a lot of things with atmospheric chemistry, very famous guy, who ended up at, uh, at Berkeley. Uh, Neil Pings, who was, uh, went to Caltech and eventually became provost at USC. Ross Hardwick, who was at UCLA, and Frank Harris, who went to Utah. And let me talk about the modern era. You're going to love this. <laughs> Gilbert, Gilbert, G.N. Lewis went to Berkeley in 1912 and revolutionized chemistry on the, helped to revolutionize chemistry on the West Coast. And A.A. Noyes went to Caltech and did much the same thing. And nobody came to Stanford. 
but really the revolution in chemistry on the West Coast began with these guys. And 19, I bet you didn't know that Fred Terman got his bachelor's degree in chemistry, but it shows you what, what a good education can do for you. <laughs> he, however, like uh, Mr. Sapp, uh, decided that it wasn't good enough and went into electrical engineering. <laughs> In any event, uh, in the uh, late 1950s, uh, Terman and, and uh, Wallace Sterling uh, decided they were going to really change the university and created, as uh, it was described, sort of the steeples of excellence. And chemistry was the place they decided to start. And one of the things about this story that makes it extraordinary is that a lot of other universities tried to do things like this, and it's probably fair to say that none of them succeeded, certainly not on the scale that, that was uh, a success story here. And a lot of that has to do with, with seeding all of these disciplines. A lot of it has to do with what happened bringing the medical school down here, and a lot of it has to do with really extraordinary good judgment. So when uh, Terman uh, brought Bill Johnson uh, to Stanford. Uh, there was a real revolution. And that process, by the way, was one of the, the stories, one of the apocryphal stories, uh, was that uh, somehow or other, uh, in the process of trying to recruit executive heads, uh, they settled on Bill Libby. Uh, from my personal experience, they were lucky he decided not to come. But, I mean, he's a great scientist, but I'm not sure he would have provided the kind of leadership that we actually got. But apparently Libby came out, and he looked around, and he said, where's the machine shop? And, of course, we didn't have one. And uh, he said, well, I certainly wouldn't come to a place where they didn't have a machine shop. And so... Terman went to Chicago and hired the entire machine shop and brought all these people out here. And when I came, there was a really great machine shop. <laughs> and uh, so I, I think that was uh, uh, in chemical engineering news, you can see that uh, there was a lot of important hires that went on. Uh, Bill Johnson brought with him, Carl Jurassic, the two joined the faculty at about the same time. And then they appointed Paul Flory, uh, who had been the uh, head of the Mellon Institute. And so these are just quotes from that, uh, that article. So here's Bill Johnson. And here's a more recent picture. Bill went, really was an extraordinary guy. And he was a great scientist, and he did really fantastic chemistry. But he also provided the kind of leadership and strength that I think you need if you're going to do the kinds of things that went on in chemistry at Stanford. He brought in a really wonderful bunch of people. You'll see uh, their names that are going to appear here. But he managed to integrate them into the department in a way that I was really amazed at when I came. The socialization between the new people and the old people was really remarkable. Uh, they didn't hesitate to party and drink and, and generally treated each other both with uh, friendship and respect. And uh, the result of that, I think, was that the department functioned uh, really well. So he appointed Carl Jurassic. And Paul Flory, who won a Nobel Prize. And Henry Tauby, who used to like to party. <laughs> but also did really wonderful chemistry. He was, these guys were really smart. And you can't imagine how terrifying it was to be an assistant professor in a department like this. Because there, was, there weren't any other young faculty members when I first came. 
And I, you know, I didn't, I would, didn't even want to call these guys by their first names. So I waited till they looked at me before I would start a conversation. <laughs> Gene Van Tabben, another really great organic chemist. Hardin McConnell, who knew more science than you could possibly imagine. So these were people, I think, that really made the department. And when Bill Johnson came, let's see what's on the next slide. Oh, I want to do the buildings, and then I'll come back to this in a minute. Now remember, I got this out of Eric Hutchins' book. So the main building was remodeled, was remodeled in, 19, in the 60s, and it was abandoned about 1986 because it was deemed to be an earthquake hazard. And uh, I think Eric thought it was gone. And this is what happened after the earthquake. So you can get an idea of uh, some of the damage. So in, 19, in uh, 1999, it looked like this. Here's some figures you might find amusing. The main building, 60,000 square feet, $233,000. Interesting to look at the Loquet building which is, I think, an extraordinary laboratory and one that you should, if you get a chance, you should uh, have a look at. 85,000 square feet, but $42 million. Uh, one of the reasons for the increase in price is the, is the whole business about air handling and safety. And that, of course, drives the price of these uh, technical buildings up tremendously. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, you can see that old chem was a real bargain. <laughs> this was the organic chem chemistry building. It's, it, went, it, disappeared. it disappeared a few weeks ago. I've, never, I've seen buildings go up. They take a long time. Boy, you can bring them down really fast. It just, it just vanished. The Stauffer buildings, uh, there are three of them, and uh, <coughs> the third one was chemical engineering, the first organic chemistry, the second physical chemistry. So Stauffer one was built in 1960, was occupied by Johnson and Jurassic primarily. Stauffer II uh, had Flory in it and then uh, subsequently uh, 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 Jim Coleman and, and Henry Tauby. The mud building was constructed in 1977. Notice that uh, it doesn't look, it, it has a fortress-like appearance, <clears throat> and that was in part because it was meant uh, not to be tampered with by uh, outsiders. Uh, the Keck building, 1988, and the Loquet building in 2007. And the SAP Center, uh, which you see here in uh, 2016, uh, provides, I think, a, a, a wonderful bookend uh, to this collection of pictures. Now, of course, the faculty hasn't been static, and I'm not going to hit you with all the names of everybody one at a time. But these are more recent faculty that started at Stanford. The first three of us, uh, me, Bob Pecora, and Hans Anderson, really lived through this transition. We were all there at a time when <clears throat> things were just beginning. Uh, subsequent appointments, you can see quite a lot of very distinguished people. Uh, running down through the younger people that are here. Um, I told you that uh, 
Uh, Professor Franklin was the only member of the National Academy that had been here <coughs> uh, prior to Bill Johnson's arrival. Uh, subsequently, uh, 24 members of the faculty became uh, members of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, 14 are currently still, uh, still alive. Uh, 12 uh, members of the faculty uh, won the National Medal of Science. So you can see that the appointments uh, that happened subsequent to this initial transition were, I think, really significant ones and really mattered. These are people who started here. These are people who were recruited. Jim Coleman, Linus Pauling, Dick Zare, you, well, you can look at the list. It's an extraordinarily distinguished list and uh, one that I think that we can all be really proud of. And then there's this subset who were recruited here and then left. <laughs> so that's a story of all of the people that represented this transition uh, from being, as I say, a, a really great, good univer regional university to a world-class institution. And I think uh, what you can learn from this is that it does, things like this don't happen by accident. There was a huge investment of resources in the department in bringing the medical school in improving biology and physics, and generally being supportive of the needs of the faculty. And you can't be a faculty member here and not understand how critical it is to have the kinds of institutional leadership that Stanford has provided in all this time. The, the, the uh, administration, without exception, has been really supportive of the faculty and faculty. Of course, we want more. <laughs> but, but the administrations have been really supportive of excellence. And when there's something you want to do that you need to do, they're there really to help. And I'd like to say again, I'd like to thank uh, Eric, Harry, Carol, W.E., Professor Gilmore, for all of their background material, which has really made it possible for me to give this talk. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Sapp and his fellow donors who really made this building uh, livable and wonderful. And thank you for your attention. You know, I'm not. I'm not actually sure when that came down. Um, I, I know there's vestiges of the wall that connected that building to old chemistry uh, that are still out there. We we worked to kind of work it into the terrace, but I probably should know what year that doll came down. I, I don't. It's, I don't know if anybody here might actually know that. I remember. In the 60s. What, I think in, the 60s. in the 60s, we're hearing. Thank you. Yes. Well, maybe you could just repeat the question so it gets clear. Right, but that's fine. What did you do to stabilize the walls that you didn't take down? I mean, what, what's holding them up? So we, take, we first take the structure down. The well, question was about what, it, what do you do to stabilize those walls that were remaining? Um, and we shotcrete, which means you're spraying concrete to back up the wall and give it rigidity. Uh, and then the, the structure gets built almost somewhat independent of those walls, but helps to strengthen the walls as it's, um, we go up the different floors. But, but I'll, I'll say something, because I took a tour during that period when the floors had been removed and the ceiling were supported by these aluminum columns. And they were about to do this shock creating process. And I said, wow, this looks pretty unstable. And, <laughs> and they said, yeah, for about, I don't know, three months or something? 
So, so for three months, Old Kim was massively exposed to an earthquake. Had an earthquake struck in that position. Yeah, we would not have this building. It, it would have been completely destroyed. So we all held our breath for that period, the hope that we could get the wall shot created, the steel goes in behind, I guess, and ties it together. And then you put the lateral floors back in to support the, the side pressure. But, you know, it was a, it was a long four months. <laughs> I have a question for, for John Brownman. Uh, John, you had the picture of uh, Robert Swain up there, and you meant that he had been uh, president uh, temp temporarily. Actually, I think when Ray Lyman Wilbur went back to serve as Secretary of the Interior, he did not resign as president of Stanford. He simply took a leave, and uh, Swain was actually acting president for a number of years. And yet, when we look at the Stanford history, we don't see his name there. <laughs> But uh, do you have any uh, other memories of, of Swain? I, he's, he, I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Anyone, yes? When uh, that building was removed, I think it was in the 60s, it was considered an absolute phenomenon that Stanford actually removed the building. Oh my God. <laughs> one, of, one of the first demolitions ever, huh? <laughs> Yes. Other than mentioning Mrs. Stanford, I never heard a single woman mention, though there were a couple of names and no pictures, were there never any females in the whole department all these years? Yes. <laughs> Ray Eustace, whose name you may not recognize as being a woman, was a member of the faculty for, I don't know, a fair, fair number of years. Uh, we had a couple of assistant professors. We currently have uh, uh, Bien Chao Shui and uh, Carolyn Bertozzi and Lynette Sigelski as members of the department. So we've uh, grown up. Uh, yes, uh, I think in the early days there were, there were no women members of the department. Uh, I think that was quite common, as far as I can tell, by looking at other chemistry departments. Uh, it's unfortunate, but it's a fact. I'm sorry, Mr. Tim, I didn't the Stanford website. Question for David, but perhaps for anyone. Do you have any anecdotes about the landscaping around there? Did you try to restore a certain look? And specifically, the home site entrance. I guess the, the east entrance. Right now it's very open. Um, did you have future plans for what that might be used for, or is it so sort of, is the vision um, executed already? I think I think you know la landscapes interesting, um, and our senior landscape architect is here, Kathy Blake. Um, What's interesting about it is, is the building doesn't grow and change all that much, but the landscaping does. So when you you see those early pictures. Um, the building was very visible. Uh, now you see the ears of the oval. You see the area in front of the building. Um, and, you know, it's a little bit more buffered from view. And we have discussed in our office how much do you work to thin that out, if you do at all, so that you could possibly see the building uh, from Palm Drive. But as you could tell, um, we did end up cutting down Cypress. We ended up coming down those big overgrown shrubs. Uh, partly to, to restore the building, but partly because it's time to sort of look for new growth. I think the redwood trees really help to provide the scale. It's important. Um, and then terrace in the back, I wanted to make sure there was enough landscaping to provide shade uh, so people could come together. Yes, there's a question in the back. More of a curiosity question. Uh, you mentioned Professor Terman went and got a machine shop. Well, I just wondered, did they enlarge the glass flowing capability at the same time? With glass blowing, uh, we 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 did hire a glass blower. Um, it was a little hit and miss. Uh, one of the things that 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 happened, it, it, the the uh, engineers had a tube shop, which which would also do things for you as well. Uh, we had a, a glass blower who was permanently here, 
And then gradually, as time went on and you could buy more things, the workload decreased and then you know you ended up on a part-time basis. So uh, those kinds of skills, when I started, it was the expectation that you could actually blow glass, you know, and uh, I wasn't too good at it, and, uh, and neither was anybody else. <laughs> and, and so you ended up with a glass blower, and after a while, the equipment that you needed, you could actually get, uh, in many cases, elsewhere. So we didn't bring in anybody special. Quick. Um, looking at the photos today, um, made me realize for the first time that the, the staircase that was restored was much more was much narrower than what exists now. So is the restored staircase with the beautiful balustrade in the same place, or and so what did you do with it? I cheated. <laughs> the question the question was that looked awful narrow um i cheated that that was a portion of the stair that went from the second level higher and we could not carry the cast iron stair all the way up like it had been before um that that narrower part went to the more utilitarian parts of the building so we we thought that would that's a little bit of a compromise but we we got the main stair the main width from that main level up to the second level so that a good eye. That was a good eye. I'll never use that slide again. <laughs> Mary, just quickly, what has been the student response to the renovation after so many years of this being closed? <coughs> Who had? They have to find a new building to break into at night. <laughs> yeah, I think also because they did a, the new building over um, for Hoover uh, Center. And that took out some secret underground entrance into the Hoover Tower, I understand. Yeah. Um, so the students are going to have to look for new ways of amusing themselves. Yeah, I, I also think there, there are some plans coming up that will even bring more life to this area. There's some, some enhancements to the terrace, for example. Uh, there is a new cafe that is being built that will be a regional cafe for this entire quad and commons. And I think the more and more that we can start to bring people and mix them around campus. I mean, I think our, our biggest fear is that people just plunk somewhere and never know the rest of Stanford. So we're trying to provide unique places that get the undergraduates and the graduates and even the staff and faculty to move around. And so that cafe, the terrace, I think will really um, make this a much more sort of the heart of campus. And honestly, we talked about this with the McMurtry building that this is the boonies, right? You're, when they planned to put the art building there, it was like, we're in the boonies of campus. And now, with the, the light streaming from this building, the McMurtry building opening, we're really feeling like this is becoming an important sort of central area uh, as well. John? Yes. Uh, up here, Frank. Uh, oh. you, John, you mentioned several times the impact of moving the School of Medicine down from San Francisco to campus. Could you expand on that a little bit, how that impacted the department? Stanford is sized on the small side uh, as uh, many scientific institutions uh, go. And is this thing on? Can you, can you hear me OK? Yeah. The <clears throat> What, what happened was, in the medical school, the basic sciences, uh, biochemistry, uh, physiology, uh, you know, all the people that came with Arthur Kornberg and Josh Letterberg uh, brought with them both the intellectual power and the facilities that really made the biological sciences uh, exceptionally strong. Biology department is not large enough really to encompass all that. And so the impact of having those people around, in my experience, changed the entire world of the physical sciences because when you needed some interaction, you got it. And with Arthur Kornberg, you didn't even need the interaction. He made, made it happen. He would call me up 
and tell me I was teaching organic chemistry wrong. <laughs> he wasn't wrong either, but uh, and I was teaching it wrong because there wasn't enough bioscience in it. Uh, and uh, I think uh, having these people as colleagues uh, really made an extraordinary difference. I, I just can't imagine Stanford would be where it is if the medical school hadn't been brought down. Yes, just a couple more, please. Yes. You mentioned Professor Og in passing. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit about some of his accomplishments. Well, he was early on in the... Uh, uh, under, when Felix Bloch uh, started working on nuclear magnetic resonance, I realized instantly how important that was going to be for chemistry. And so he did some really nice, interesting experiments uh, looking at chemical structures with NMR. And he was one of the very first people in that business. He did some in really interesting experiments with liquid ammonia and uh, uh, electrons in, in uh, liquid ammonia in an attempt to understand something about what that kind of solvation looked like. So uh, uh, I'm not quite sure how much of a litany you want. Uh, he, his, I think his legacy is probably fairly minimal because of other stuff that went on. He was a bit of a character. He was, he, was, he was crazy, <laughs> but he was really smart. I mean, I never met him. He, he, had, he, he, he committed suicide, which is why he died young. And uh, I, when I came, he, was already, he had already passed away. So much of what I heard was from the graduate students that I would talk to who, who knew him. Uh, as well as his faculty colleagues, uh, so I don't really—I didn't really actually know him, but everybody agreed that he was just unbelievably smart. Yes, last question. <coughs> I want to say something different. I should say yes. this gentleman, whose name I used in vain. Is <laughs> Professor Huggins from the Material <laughs> Science Department. I was born when my father was on the chemistry faculty at Stanford University. He joined the chemical, uh, chemistry faculty here in 1925, and I was born in 29. So I've seen Stanford for a long time. And when I came back in 1954 as a green young faculty member here, after having been in the East Coast, I was invited to give a talk in the chemistry department at a very nice amphitheater you used to have in the front corner of the building. And I walked over to the chemistry building to look around and try to find out where it was I was supposed to give this talk. And I walked into that room and a somewhat elderly woman came in and said, Hello, Bobby. <laughs> this earning was bullware. And the chemistry department had, she was the administrator for the chemistry department. She had a sister who was the administrator for the biology department. <laughs> anyway, I walked in, brand new assistant professor, thinking I'm pretty important. <laughs> and she says, hello, Bobby. <laughs> OK, then, then, OK, yes. Yeah, question for John, a historical question. Um, my dad graduated, he was in the class of 40, and majored in engineering, and I'm sure he had classes in this building and, and labs here. Um, and then he came back after the war to get another degree, but he had spent a few quarters at Cal as well. And I remember what he used to say was, you know, the labs at Cal were much better than ours because they got um, state funding. 
that obviously Stanford didn't get. I wonder, is that really true? And then also, where is the Cal um, chemistry program gone since then? <laughs> uh, if you saw the lab that I worked in as a graduate student, we didn't have anything that was that bad around here. Uh, there, were, there were wonderful labs, and there were awful labs, and it was a mix. The University of California uh, Berkeley Chemistry Department is an absolutely outstanding department. It's been one of the very top-ranked departments, I think, uh, as long as I can remember, and it continues to be quite strong. Uh, it doesn't keep us from trying to recruit their faculty, and it doesn't keep them from trying to recruit, recruit our faculty. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, a very strong department, which is not to say that, it, that you know, one can count on what, what the state is doing in its efforts to mangle that university. So uh, it deserve, the University of California deserves all the help everybody can give it. And uh, I think the, the uh, decrease in state funding has been having an influence on it, but it still remains very strong. I would like to uh, repeat now a story I told John early today that um, when Henry Talby won the Nobel Prize in the late 80s, they, uh, America won, Americans won all the research awards, and most of them were Californians. And so the California legislature decided to set aside a day for, to celebrate the Nobel laureate. So that Don Kennedy and Henry Tavi and I drove to Sacramento, uh, and I went in, uh, they went in to, to prepare their remarks, uh, and I went upstairs to sit in the chamber, and it was packed. And the reason it was packed was that Red Skelton was addressing <laughs> the assembly. And so uh, I waited, and then the, I was waiting for the Nobel Prize winner. And then, of course, then as soon as Red Skelton left, all the classes and teachers got up and left. <laughs> and, and I sat there alone uh, listening to the Nobel Prize winners. But what, on the way back, uh, Henry told this story that is truly amazing. He said that when he was a, a first uh, he, when he was first appointed as assistant professor at Berkeley, there were four people who uh, were his colleagues as assistant, new assistant professors. Of those four people, three went on to win the Nobel Prize, and one was a relative failure. He became president of Stanford. <laughs> and, and what, that is a true story. It was Ken Pitzer. And it's also true that uh, Henry said that uh, he thought that had Pitzer stayed in chemistry, he might well have won the Nobel Prize as well. But I think I've never heard a story of such strength about a department before. Thank you so much. It's been a wonderful program.